morning. Uh, hello, everyone, because again, there are people coming from different parts of the world signed up. As, as of yesterday, we uh, had about over 100 people that signed up for this event. Uh, and as we get started, hopefully they will continue joining, uh, joining us as we go forward. Um, so we have started this Coffee with the Dean event um, sometimes in September, we started talking about due to COVID and not being able to travel and meet with alumni and friends uh, that we can do virtual events. And we first started in the beginning of the spring, summer term, being able to connect them one in one on one over the phone or uh, Zoom or uh, other means virtually. And then we said maybe we can do something more broader and this then hen Hence, we have the coffee with the Dean. And unfortunately this morning, I don't have coffee with me uh, and, and I will certainly get one of those ones soon. And so we started uh, talking about what should be the topics of the conversation. We cannot just continue talking about updating the co college uh, issues. We can maybe talk about things that are relevant and also important to uh, our students and alumni. And um, this is our second Coffee with the Dean. The first event, which was last month, focused around mobility and the work that we are doing around mobility, uh, research, education, and outreach activities around mobility in the college. I invited a couple of our faculty to join me to talk about some of the work they're doing uh, in tra transportation, in computer science, in drone technology, and so on. This is the second Coffee with the Dean. We focused on global engineering education because uh, again, we strongly believe that uh, our students that should become global citizens who are able to navigate a diverse culture and economies. Around 2012, 13 timeframe, as we laid out our strategic plan for the College of Engineering, we highlighted five high impact practices that will help our student better prepared for the job of the future that can work across national and international boundaries. And one of those high impact practices was global engineering. And uh, we were able to, since then, able to send our students abroad to study abroad, to research abroad and internship abroad. Our student had been traveled to China, opportunities at Mexico, Austria, France, Japan, Italy, and we need to expand that and we need to make it um, more participation from our students to uh, go abroad. Um, the challenge for us is that getting our students understand the value of uh, global uh, skill sets, not only focusing on just what they do in Detroit and at Wayne State. So the skill set that we're looking at be able to do language and cultural skills, be able to do teamwork and group dynamic skills, knowledge of the business and engineering cultures of counterpart countries, and knowledge of international variations in engineering education and practice. So again, going abroad is one approach, but also bringing uh, a student from abroad here to our campus, recruiting them to make it to be a diverse community in our college and our campus. It, with the emphasis in global engineering and outreach, in 2018, uh, one of our alum, Dr. Nancy Philippard, and her husband, Thomas McGrail, helped us to establish a Center for Global Engineering Education. They provided a gift of $1 million for us to establish this center, which allows our students to benefit, fully benefiting with a global perspective in what they're studying. Some of our faculty volunteer to take our students overseas uh, and work with them, uh, not only work with our students, but also working with the counterpart universities who hosted us in those locations. So we would like to continue expanding this and it's becoming more and more important for us to recognize that today with the current location that we are in Detroit, we have many global OEMs in Detroit and industries that are having offices across the globe and some of those engineers come to Detroit to work with the American counterpart and some of our engineers are traveling overseas continuously as we travel with my 
colleague Ahmad Zedin here, who is here, we will see the plane is filled up with uh, business executives, engineers that are going abroad to work on their overseas, overseas operations. So it's important for us to be able to make sure our students are very comfortable in those settings and in those environments. With that in mind, we decided to establish this coffee with the dean, focusing around that, telling you what we are doing and hearing what are you, uh, your thoughts are on how we can help, you can help us in uh, enhancing this program and make it really a, a showcase for the college. With that in mind, we have several panelists here, but I'll introduce uh, my colleagues, Dr. Ahmad Izzedin, who is Associate Vice President for Educational Outreach and Global Programs at Wayne State. Dr. Izzedin, in that role, helped me quite a bit in uh, establishing many partnerships with global universities. And also he was partnered with me in sending our student overseas. He's an alum of the college. And with that short introduction, I will welcome Ahmad to say a few words and introduce the remaining panelists. Ahmad. Thank you, Farshad. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, my name, as Farshad mentioned, Ahmad Azadi, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Educational Outreach and International Programs. In my role, I oversee the university's uh, engagement with the world. The Office of International Programs is, is the, really, the, we, we see it as the gateway uh, for the world uh, and the entree of the world to Wayne State University. This we have been for the last few years working hard to really engage and provide opportunities for our students and faculty to engage, to engage globally and then to create opportunities for the world also to really meet our students and uh, know about what we have, uh, the great research that we are doing and the great uh, teaching that we have here, right here in Detroit and on campus. Um, today it gives me, and, and, and as Farshad mentioned, I'm a proud alum of the College of Engineering, uh, Industrial Engineering, uh, and I have uh, been actually, um, the, the College of Engineering has been one of our most active partners on campus. We've done some uh, great, uh, we have some great initiatives uh, that we have launched and they're usually our, the pioneers who are willing to try anything and uh, many of the things that we have tried and the initiatives we have launched with the college have really became, have become uh, models for other colleges on campus, uh, whether it is uh, dual degree programs, uh, whether it is, it is research, inter research internships, global research internships for, for students uh, and a, a few other uh, activities. Uh, but today I have the great privilege of, of uh, moderating a session with uh, three amazing uh, people, um, three alums of the college who have been uh, great supporters and uh, leaders in, in, in their own fields. Uh, and I'm I'm, I'm going to introduce them shortly. I'm going to have a few questions, and then we'll have a chance to uh, open it up to, to your questions uh, with, with, with them. Um, starting in an alph alph alphabetical order, uh, we have with us uh, Sandeep Jori. He is the CEO of Tricentis. Sandeep uh, has more than, brings more than 25, uh, and Sandeep, you can wave, <laughs> uh, brings more than 25 years of enterprise software experience. Uh, to, 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 to the field. He manages uh, all business related functions, including business strategy, product services, sales, marketing, and operations at Tricentis. Um, he most recently served as the CEO of uh, App, App Accelerator, the leading open uh, source mobile application development platform. He was vice president of strategy and industry at, uh, solutions at HP. Uh, he also served there as president of corporate development. He's a serious entrepreneur uh, as well. He launched two, uh, two startups, uh, Determina and Blue Lane, uh, their VMware companies. He also was the CEO and founder of Oblix and co-founded eBoodle, uh, one of the first uh, e-commerce comparison uh, shopping services. Uh, he collects also degrees he has an MBA from Stanford University, a master's degree in industrial engineering from Wayne State University, and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Pune. Uh, and he is an advisor and investor in several partner uh, startups, both in, in the US, the Silicon Valley, and in India. Welcome, Sandeep. Um, Thank you. So, 
Anurag Kumar uh, is uh, he's the founder of uh, eTexico, a leader in North nearshore software services with operations in Austin, in the Austin Bay area, and in Guadalajara, Aguascalientes, uh, and Aguascalientes. And within nine years, uh, Anurag grew the company from you know Boost, who he, that he co-founded and Bootstrap to a multi-million dollar company with over 300 employees and 250 clients in the U.S., Canada, uh, U.K., and Mexico. And most recently, he sold the company uh, to uh, Improving Inc. Um, so the, the company, and we, I had I had the privilege of seeing the company, and Iraq has uh, has done it's an amazing it's an amazing operation, and uh, we'll get to hear a little bit about his experience there. Um, Anurag pioneered the concept of Nearshore Plus, highlighting the advantages of U.S.-Mexico proximity and its associated benefits of increased collaboration, cultural alignment, and cost effectiveness, IP protection, proximity for its uh, U.S.-based clients. Uh, and eTexico, also another serial entrepreneur. Uh, I think there's a common thread in, among all of our panelists today. eTexico was his fifth startup. Um, he was before CEO of two IT service com services companies with operations in US and India and UK. He started a venture backed company, Media, Media Prize, where he raised over $13 million in, dollars in venture capital following by Connection and Wireless. Did I pronounce that correctly? Close enough, huh? Uh, a wireless yes. solution company and, that he sold in 2008. Uh, uh, he founded his first company, MSC, in Detroit at the age of 24 and grew it to over $1 million in revenue. Um, he is also, he worked with Dell, IBM, KPMG, TSC, and other companies, and I could go on and on. Uh, uh, and he has also, he's uh, married to Vandana, uh, another uh, Wayne State alum, engineering alum, and they both were honored uh, at the College as Distinguished Alum in 2018. Welcome, Anurag. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Na Dr. Nancy Philippart is uh, the general partner and co-founder of Bell Michigan, an early stage venture fund that invests in women-led startups. Yeah, so you see that, that, that entrepreneurial uh, link among all of our panelists. She's uh, the co-director of the Global Executive Track Doctorate Program at Wayne State and, <coughs> and is adjunct, an adjunct faculty in the College of Engineering and the Mike Illich School of Business at Wayne. She consults with new businesses, new business ventures, and is currently on the boards of several technology startups, mentors, and international women in leadership, and women up and pitch programs, and is an automotive new space innovation award judge. Uh, Nancy has been an engineer. She comes from the auto, her experiences is in the auto industry for more than 30 years. Uh, she was the executive director of GM Accessories, a $1 billion plus General Motors Corporation new venture that sells vehicles and grow corporate profits um, by, e by enabling vehicle personalization at point of sale. Um, her ex extensive experience in uh, international management and operation product development. She also is a, again, also another trend is the, the degree collection. She has a PhD in industrial systems engineering. Uh, three industrial engineers on this uh, panel here today. Um, Anurag, you're mechanical, correct? Electrical. Electrical. And computers. Okay. Um, and so she has a PhD in industrial systems engineering, MA in economics, and BS in industrial engineering from Wayne State, and an MS in biomedical engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, what one one thing about all these three wonderful panelists is, uh, I mean, I've had the privilege of meeting and working with them at the different uh, times. And we're, we're, I'm always struck by not just the intellect and the great accomplishment, but also the humility that they bring. And you always leave a meeting with them with your head like full of ideas and just more enlightened. So um, thank you all for being with us. And I'm going to start with one question for all of you, and then we'll go into details about others. You all, ha you all have been great champions for and supporters of the College of Engineering. Um, and Wayne State. What drives you to do that? Nancy, we'll start with you. Um, I think what drives me to um, do that is I, um, it's my opportunity to sort of pay it forward. Um, I um, had a 
with through the the times that I, I studied at the college, um, I had tremendous opportunity, um, and I see Wayne State as a really important foundation um, for the stepping stones and the ultimate success that I had um, in my career. Um, I also um, have to say I truly enjoy Wayne State students because. Um, there are students that are practical. Um, again, the demographics of our students, um, you know, even, I mean, I myself was first generation college. Even today, we service uh, many first generation college students, and they're practical, they're hands on, um, they're uh, innovative, um, and, you know, they are very, um, you know, I find it very satisfying to work with students who, um, I know are going to be able to be successful. So it, it's really an opportunity to, to pay it forward. And I think the mission of the university and its location in Detroit, um, we serve a, a very, very important role, not only in the region, but as evidenced by where our graduates go, um, you know, our, our graduates are making, making a difference, um, you know, not only nationally, but internationally. Thank you. Sandeep? Yeah, uh, very similar to me, uh, but slightly different. I, I came to the country in 1983 and where I, I landed in Detroit and spent my first uh, five years in the Detroit area. But I think of Wayne State as, as home to me because it really, um, it was my first experience in the US. It was a fantastic experience. The university was just incredible. Uh, you know, the international center was, was helpful. I was in uh, industrial engineering. Each of my professors, uh, Dr. Knappenberger, uh, who was the dean at the time, or no, he was the head of the department, just took a real personal interest uh, in me. And, and I feel like I, I wouldn't have done, uh, been successful or done anything uh, in my life without the opportunity I got from Wayne State. And uh, to me, it's just uh, giving back in, in any way. Uh, it was so formative for me. Um, I, I spent two years at the university. I also, Dr. Knappenberger also asked me to teach a graduate class after I graduated, which was, again, a unique opportunity. Uh, it's a little bit of an immigrant story. It didn't land with 20 bucks in the pocket, as most people like to say, uh, though I, I think I should make it more interesting by saying, claiming that. But I did come with only one semester's worth of tuition and uh, and had no idea how I was going to figure it all out. But Wayne State made it happen for me. I, I taught, I worked, uh, just the, the dean, faculty, students, uh, every everything was just Incredible, incredible. So for me, it's it's all about giving giving back and and uh, uh, seeing what you know if others can have as good an experience and and have as impactful an experience when they come to graduate school. For me, it was tremendously impactful. I I, I could I could relate uh, to several parts uh, of of, of the story. Um, I was an international student myself. Uh, came in eighty eight. Uh, to Wayne State in 89. And I also had uh, Dr. Knappenberger. Um, I managed to pass his, his stats class with a B. <laughs> so <laughs> I had Dr. Knappenberger too. <laughs> yeah, so he was, a, he was a tough cookie, but great, 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 great man. Uh, Anurag. Um, uh, not, not, to, not to show off, but I got an A in every class of his. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I only had one class with them, so I think... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, good morning, uh, uh, Manurag and Rag Kumar. Uh, Sandeep and I, we actually used to hang out together. Uh, we, we share a long, long history. Uh, like Sandeep, uh, Detroit was almost my first landing spot in the US. I, I landed there in 84. Uh, the, the interesting thing was that before Detroit, I had uh, one year in Pittsburgh, but really I grew up in Detroit. Uh, and before Wayne State, I actually started, I was working and going to school full time. Uh, so two full time things going on. I started my master's in Oakland University. I did one semester there and then my job changed and it moved to downtown Detroit as a part time programmer at that time. And in those days, I-75 was not the easiest commute 
from Auburn Hills all the way to downtown Detroit every day. So I, one day I showed up at the university, and I forget the dean at that time, and I said, sir, I think he was from India or Pakistan, I said, sir, I, I can't commute all the way. Can I please get into Wayne State? I need to complete my master's. So I'm from IIT, I had good grades, and without any application or anything, not only he transferred me to Wayne State, he transferred all my credits from Oakland University. So I landed in Wayne State, I stayed on the campus for a while, Along the way, I got married, Varna Kumar, and then she joined Wayne State. And at, the, at one time, we were taking our classes together. And once in a while, you know, I hate to admit that he would do my homework because I was also working full time. And, you know, one of the common courses was the pacing. And so just a lot of fond memories how Wayne State took us in, uh, two young married couple, me working full time. And I remember I used to commute to Lansing because that's where my job was at. So I would commute to Lansing, do my homework in the evening, uh, run back to Wayne to do my evening classes. Just a lot of effort, a lot of uh, positive experience. I saw the library going up uh, in those days. Uh, and I stayed in Detroit for uh, almost 12 years. Uh, so Detroit is kind of my home. Both my kids were born in Detroit. One in Detroit, one in uh, Royal Oak. I started my first company there. I got my first... And that company didn't do quite as well. Uh, I got a first break at IBM, and then IBM moved me to Austin, where is where, which is where I am. So, like some deep, I'm a serial entrepreneur. But the thought is, Wayne State made us where we are. It gave us opportunity. It gave us the the landing spot. It treated us really, really well. And this is our opportunity to to do something uh, back for the university, giving back either financially or otherwise. So I'm really honored to be invited to this uh, this uh, webinar or this uh, this meeting and share our experiences with you and perhaps uh, give you some ideas as what can be done to continue to grow uh, Wayne State University. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you so much, Anurag. Staying staying with that theme of of really giving you opportunities, you have started to give Wayne State students opportunities as well. I I, I had the privilege of traveling with Farshad to. To, to Mexico with you uh, to eat Texaco and you started an internship uh, for Wayne State student, engineering students. Can you talk a little bit about that? What, what start, how's that started and where do you see that developing and how it could continue to help students? So just, just as a background, uh, my, my company iTexaco has teams in Mexico, in two locations in Mexico, in Agos Calientes, Guadalajara, providing IT services, software development, digital services to clients in the US. Uh, that was my first experience being exposed to Mexico. You know, you know, we have all traveled to India, to Europe, to, to all other parts of the world, but very few people have actually experienced working with talent in Mexico. And when I started the company in 2011, I really had no idea how it might shape up. It's just, just I thought, let me try that. I met uh, my current partner, and we just started building a company, uh, hiring people there and serving customers in U.S. And I realized that there is a huge opportunity and talent in Mexico beyond manufacturing, beyond all the media things we read about. Uh, it's a, it's a beautiful country, a lot of talent, a lot of good universities, and I was literally surprised how little interaction. The universities in the U.S. have with universities in Mexico, and I'm in Texas. And even in Texas, which is next door to Mexico, the level of awareness is quite limited. So as I started thinking, and I started, and also Agus Colentes is a manufacturing town, uh, one of the two of the world's biggest Nissan plants are in Agus Colentes. Guadalajara uh, is electronics hub, manufacturing, uh, supply chain, aerospace. And I was thinking, Detroit has the same characteristics automotive manufacturing, supply chain. Uh, so what, what can I do to put at least the two cities together? Uh, so I started working for Shad and his team and they were very open to exploring it. So we had a delegation from Detroit uh, to, to Mexico. We had a delegation from Mexico to Detroit and things started happening. And then I said, what can I do to introduce the students in the uh, US some experience in Mexico? So we sponsored uh, internships. We had four students who actually 
in spite of their parents' recommendations, they actually came to Mexico and they had an amazing time. They learned something they'd never thought is possible. They saw what it is to like work in Mexico, which is a country next door, but seems sometimes so far away. And our team in Mexico had an amazing time interacting with students from US. They, it, it just doesn't happen. And I think this is an opportunity worth exploring uh, where students and faculty in Mexico can interact with faculties and students in Mexico. So, you know, and especially in these trying times where we need a few more foreign students or international students, there is a huge potential I see to attract students in Mexico with grants, with, uh, with uh, special areas of studies, and in addition, exchanging faculty back and forth. Uh, and you have to trust me when I say it's actually quite safe. It's actually a very pretty country, and the weather is beautiful. Right now it's 75 degrees and sunny in Guadalajara. Uh, so anytime you want to go in winters, uh, you'll have a lovely time. Uh, and that's where uh, my passion has become recently, is to bridge the gap, to build more bridges between the two nations, which sometimes seem so far away and far apart, even though they, they share such a common, not only the border, but a lot of history, a lot of culture, uh, I'm in Texas, they tell me at one time Texas was actually part of Mexico, just the border move, people are still the same. Uh, but we somehow, we don't realize all that. And I would definitely continue to encourage Fachad and his team to, to increase that level of partnership and collaboration uh, with, with, with Mexico. And I'm, I'm open to helping in any way I can. Thank you. Uh, and and it's it actually, it, yeah, it, it makes sense for us to connect with just the proximity of the same time zone. There's a lot of pluses and we have, thanks to you and your introductions, we've had, we have now uh, a good and, and developing partnership with the Pan American University in Aguascalientes. So it's been, it's been great. Um, Sandeep, you you also has have helped and are helping uh, with with a similar initiative, in, you know, developing the University of Pune in in, in India, and and there's you're also working on a uh, we're engaging the College of Engineering with a uh, training program for uh, Tricentis. Can you talk about both and you know what what's uh, what, what's the latest? <laughs> Yeah, so we we are a software company, and and our product is a testing uh, product that that companies, large companies, use to to test their software, whatever software they've developed, whether it's a, a auto company or a bank or an insurance company, anything that any software that they have is uh, it needs to be tested before it's put out there for usage, and uh, we help them uh, do that testing. So a we and then we are the global leader in that in that space, uh, number one in the space globally. So I, we are always looking for testers that are certified on our platform that know how to use the product because that's how our customers can can employ them. And and uh, the more familiar people are with the product, the better it is for us. So I, I was talking to the dean and came up with this, I, I said, you know, we would love to develop a course. The funny thing is testing is so critical in software development, but very few universities, almost none, offer any uh, courses in testing. So it's just one of those things which you, you learn all about writing software code, but you don't learn much about testing, which is so critical. It's kind of the other half of, uh, of, of software development. So, uh, we uh, we partnered with the university and developed a curriculum around uh, around software testing, and we made some of the materials available. We we sponsored one of the faculty members to come out to um, Tricentis was uh, headquartered originally in Austria. That's where it came out of. So we had him come out and visit us uh, to get to learn about the product, about the company, about the space. He also attended a conference that we have annually just to get more familiar and then put a put a great uh, semester long course together and, and we ran through. Uh, so we sponsored the, uh, the the dean can say exactly what we sponsored. I'm not sure, but we sponsored effectively the, that course, which was a, a innovative course in the sense that very few universities offer that. And if you have, you know, come graduating out, it makes you more marketable. Uh, so I hope it was useful for the students as well. 
and I think we'll continue to do that because the curriculum has been developed already. Uh, somewhat different, my undergrad uh, college was uh, it was one of the oldest colleges in India called, you know, uh, College of, uh, since it was the only college at the time, it was called College of Engineering, very creative. Uh, it, it was because it was the only one in the country. Uh, but it's based in Pune, and that's where I graduated from. And I was trying, and I was also involved with the alumni uh, group there. Uh, so I put uh, put Wayne State and the College of Engineering Pune together. And uh, I, I think uh, when, when uh, Ahmad and, and the dean had visited India, they went and met with the director of the college. Uh, the dean there was called the director. Um, and I think we are building some, some programs together, which, uh, you know, like me, there could be other students that would find uh, coming to Wayne State very useful. Wayne State students could make, uh, you know, do a semester abroad kind of a thing. Pune in India is one of the tech hubs, so it it is also it's also an auto hub. It's where most of the it's kind of the Detroit of India as far as automobiles are concerned. So it just made a lot of sense, and and uh, I'm really grateful that that the dean actually took that and and to, took the trouble to go and visit the college, and and hopefully there'll be more programs that come out of it. Our, our uh, the, the trip that we canceled right before we had to go on lockdown was supposed to go to be to India and the University of Pune was one of our stops. So hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully in June, uh, Nancy, right? <laughs> we can go hopefully. back. <laughs> uh, so na listening to, 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 to Sandeep and Anurag, and I you know we have talked about really the cultural intelligence is really at, at the cornerstone of this for our students, for students from the, around the world to really be able to work and function. Uh, they have to really be able to do that in a globally, in a global sense, you know, uh, company, you know, and, and I, I, if anything, the pandemic has really proved how, how small our world is, right? Uh, so you have been a great advocate, uh, contributor and, and driver for cultural intelligence. Why is that important now? And what, and what, what, how do we continue to integrate it and build it into our curricula and our teaching and why it's important to include it in everything we do? Well, I, uh, I think I learned the hard way of why cultural intelligence um, is so important. Um, you know, I had the opportunity in my automotive career um, to work internationally. Um, and again, the way that so many large companies are working is on diverse cross-cultural virtual teams uh, with groups of people that have a set of deliverables but very unlikely is the company going to bear the travel expense to bring people together. So people get, you know, a computer, a modem, um, a set of deliverables um, and are told, this is your team, um, figure it out. And that can become a very challenging uh, effort um, when that kind of work situation happens. And I found myself in that work situation and then I found myself as a global leader of, um, you know, I, uh, in, in the last assignment I had before I left the industry, I had um, engineers, well, not just engineers, I had people from all different functions working in eight different locations around the world, but having to work together um, to um, design, develop, execute, market and sell um, product that these were all after aftermarket um, OEM produced aftermarket parts that were sold in the dealerships um, in the various places that uh, around the world that GM sold automobiles. And we, I learned that people did not, I mean, you know, culture is something that we all take for granted. Um, you know, we're acculturated from the minute we're born. Our parents start it when we go to school you know, our communities, our neighborhoods, our, you know, um, the, uh, you know, churches and temples and so on that, that we, we um, uh, attend all develop um, this set of beliefs and values that we take as being normal. Um, and we don't oftentimes understand that our cultural beliefs and values differ from others' cultural beliefs and values. And I really wanna highlight different means different. It doesn't mean one is better or worse than the other. But if you don't understand those differences and you're not even aware of your own cultural values, that has a huge impact on how you behave. 
and it has a huge impact on how you behave at work. And I like to tell this story because not only does it make things, you know, sometimes the dynamics of people working together difficult, but it can have huge, huge impact on business performance. So the story that I like to, to tell um, is that, um, you know, we were doing an engineering program in Seoul, Korea, but it was an international program. So we had people from Germany and we had people from Mexico and we had people from Brazil and we had people from the US and we had people from Canada um, that were all working together because these product that we were developing were gonna be sold in all those markets. <clears throat> and so I was the executive in charge of that program um, the people that were working on that program were several levels lower in the organization than me, but my American leadership instincts said, you know, this is going to be a tough program. Um, we're, you know, we're working virtually. These people are never going to meet each other. We're traversing time zones and we had a pretty tight time schedule and a pretty tight budget to make this happen. And of course, you know, we had promised a lot of things to dealers. They're all excited about when they're gonna get this product, pro, um, product. And so my American leadership instinct was to say, I'm gonna participate in these meetings, even though I normally would not have, because then I can help remove roadblocks right, you know, right um, um, on site. And so, you know, every morning, and I tell you, we did these meetings because of bridging time zones at 5 a.m every Tuesday morning. Um, and so I'm thinking we're making progress because you know people are saying, oh, this is, you know, we're getting status of what's going on. Six months before launch, I'm on a plane. I head to, to Seoul. Um, you know, I go into the prototype shop at it happens to be a Bupyong. And I can see this program is in bad shape. And my reaction was to be angry of like, why are people telling me everything is going well? Because again, my American context basically said, um, my employees in America would have said, um, you know, something isn't going right. And so ultimately to make a long story short, um, we were six months late for launch. It cost us, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and a lot of dealer dissatisfaction um, because I did not understand the Korean concept of face. And once I understood that my presence in those meetings wasn't helping, it was hurting because those subordinates in the organization were never going to say something bad in front of a senior leader. And I didn't get that. And so once, you know, I had that very profound learning that set me on a journey to educate myself about cultural intelligence, because I'm thinking if I'm making these mistakes, there are a lot of people in that situation that also don't understand. So that fired me up to say, I'm, I'm on uh, a journey to make sure that, um, you know, our students and as many business people as I consult with understand cultural intelligence. Thank you. And, and you're, 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 uh, you're practicing what you're preaching. Uh, I know we are working on several projects where you're integrating those things in your classes. I know you also, you and your husband started the Nancy Philippart and Thomas McGrail Center for Global Engineering Education. And I am assuming that's at the heart, at, part of, at the heart of some of that. Um, yeah, it, it absolutely is. I mean, my vision is I would like to see every Wayne State uh, engineering student have a global experience. And so the kinds of initiatives um, that Sandeep and Anurag are doing to do um, internships um, is great. The, the research study abroad is great. But I'm also practical enough to know that given the demographics of Wayne State students, it is not going to be possible for all of our students to do um, a study abroad or a research abroad. Um, and so there are lots of creative ways that we can still bring international experiences. And one of the things that um, I'm doing in one of the courses that I teach, which I think is really very representative of how our students are going to work, but we have partnered with a university in um, at Harz University of Applied Sciences in Germany. And so we have, um, uh, in the brave new world of virtual, um, this is very easy to do, we have co-mingled our students on cross-cultural um, teams and we've given them a joint assignment to work on. And between myself and some of the faculty at HARS who have been amazing, um, you know, we've been doing joint lectures 
um, for our students. Um, we each, um, you know, have shared, um, you know, we mentor uh, these teams and we're really looking forward to December to see uh, the output. So this is a pilot, um, but I think it's very applicable and I think this is the way that we can um, assure that our students have a cross-cultural experience, but they're also getting experience on virtual leadership, traversing time zones, and still meeting deliverables, which is, again, the way a lot of people work today. And we're, yeah, that's, that's great. We're investing uh, significantly now in really developing these virtual exchange uh, opportunities for our students because that's, especially in the pandemic, nobody can go anywhere at this point, uh, but to, to help really give them that exposure. Um, I know I have a million other questions, but I want to I wanna stop and turn it over to, to the audience. Uh, Farshad, do you, you, know, you want to lead this next? And uh, any other questions? And we'll take them. I don't know how you want to do them. Um, let me, uh, since, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nancy uh, and Sandeep and Anurag. As a matter of fact, what Nancy is doing, cultural intelligence, it's something that we are trying to make it to be a course that would be uh, for the entire university, not only for the College of Engineering, that uh, really evaluate the students before their trip to a foreign country for a study, research, or internship abroad, and then evaluate when they come back. Marisa is here. Uh, I see her on uh, my screen. Hi, Marisa. Uh, she is one of our recent graduates from the college, and uh, she also was president of the Society of Women Engineers in the college. And, played a key leadership role in that organization, Society of Women Engineers. Marisa, did you go to China while you were here? I did, yeah. Um, Can you show us part. your experience? I, I think Dr. Chin and Tan led that uh, yeah. To visit. Yeah. Yeah, I went um, on the global engineering cross-functional problem solving uh, study abroad experience in the summer of 2014, and that was in um, collaboration with Dr. Philip Hart. So we actually did do a cultural intelligence exam um, or profile before we went on that trip. And then we were in um, Hangzhou, China at the Zhejiang University of Technology for six weeks uh, where we were put in not only cross-functional uh, teams, but, but uh, interdisciplinary and cross-cultural as well. So our teams were scattered to work on a project-based um, engineering solution to solve some of the global transportation challenges uh, as we push forward to electric and autonomous and um, it was a very very high fast-paced uh, course where we were working with about four american students from wayne state and two uh, chinese students on the same team and they purposely scattered us so that it wasn't just um, mechanical engineers working together you know it was mechanical biomedical chemical um, in a master's level engineering course. And so we were able to learn on the fly what it's really like um, in five or six weeks to build that rapport cross-culturally with our, with our classmates um, and build some of those cultural intelligence skills through project-based learning. And uh, we were able to present that to executives at the end of the program uh, in China after touring a few uh, lead companies in, in that technology space and then bring those skills back to Wayne State where we did another cultural intelligence assessment uh, led by Dr. Philip Hart and really saw how much measurable, tangible growth that we that we were able to take through that experience. And uh, one of the highlights of my Wayne State education for sure and something that launched me into, into my career. Thank you, Marisa. I, I know that uh, as Nancy said, the, the, we, the, the type of the students that we have at Wayne State, sometimes you have to push them to get out. But I tell them, I want to get you out of here. Go, go away. And, and you can see that there are students here on our campus who have never even traveled outside of Detroit or, or, or been in Macomb County from Macomb to Detroit and back. And it's really uh, fulfilling to see them get on the plane, get the passport and get on the plane and leave for a while and coming back totally changed. And most universities who offer these type of programs, which they do, uh, they don't have this cultural intelligence component to it to really assess how students learn, not only just going and sightseeing and so on, but also doing a study and research and coming back totally different uh, and becoming a, a good citizen, global citizens that we want them to be. 
with that in mind, I think I want to hear some of you as an alumni and share with us what can you do for us, for our students in really implementing this global engineering education? What Nancy, Sandeep, and Anurag shared with you were some of their thoughts and some of their contribution to the college uh, in terms of implementing this global experience. And I want to hear what you have to suggest and offer so we can make sure that uh, we can implement them. Or any other comments that you may any have. Any questions? Yeah, any questions to our panelists or comments? First, you, can, you can raise your hand um, where the participant is. There is a little hand guy right, that you can raise your hand and ask questions or just unmute yourself and jump in. So uh, I could not hear you well enough. Could you try it again? And the one you're next. Okay. I'm not able to hear yeah. her well enough. Anybody else can? Day one. Dewan? Um, I do have a question. Dewan Woods, Director of Corporate Relations here at Wayne State University. Um, with the new Biden Harris administration, <laughs> what are you all's thoughts about um, opportunities for international exchange to reset some of the conversation that um, maybe have been, has been challenged over the last uh, four years or three and a half years or three years and more. And uh, as an opportunity just to reset and have Wayne State really become a leader with our connection to or the Canadian border um, having a, a, a diverse range of international students. Um, what are you all's thoughts as, as leaders that we can as a university and, and, and Dr. Fatui and, and Ahmad as a dean's leadership really take it to the next level in the next four years? Thank you. Again, when you look at the challenges of higher education, uh, affordability is one of the top elements of uh, being able to, it doesn't matter if you're international or you're a domestic student, but affordability is a, a big challenge in higher education in America. But also global, I mean, uh, the, the um, social economical challenges that we are facing, uh, political challenges we are facing uh, to be able to open, uh, broadening um, our horizons, working with our international partners. As I mentioned earlier, working with Ahmad and some of our faculty, we have established many partnerships across the globe, many universities, and uh, try to really building those partnerships. We had to put a halt to it uh, for the past four years. We could not really do much uh, in terms of exchanging students or faculty or research. And we are very optimistic that hopefully we can maybe make uh, some of those uh, uh, partnerships stronger as we go forward. Sandeep and Anurag. Uh, yeah. This is. I, I was just going to comment. Uh, it's been very disheartening, actually, over the last four years. Uh, you know, when I was uh, graduating from college, uh, undergrad, it was, a, you know, it was it was an aspirational goal to go to a, a uh, to go for an advanced degree to a U.S. university. I didn't even think about going somewhere else because it was kind of the the it, it was just you know, it was the best place to go, the best country to go to and all of that. And it's very disheartening to see when, when I talk to uh, the younger generation in India, uh, especially the last four years, I shouldn't say especially only the last four years have really created this uh, <clears throat> image of the U.S. being a terrible place, uh, which is completely unwelcoming of uh, of, of graduate students and you know, people even wonder, you know, that the U.S. is anti-science and, and stuff like that, which just boggles my mind. Uh, so people, when I talk to younger generation, in, at least in India, where I'm more aware, and to some degree in Europe, though the flow from there is not as big, they're considering almost every other alternative except the U.S. You know, Canada, U.K., Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, uh, you know, and, and it's very disheartening to me that we have created this situation. Well, hopefully that's going to change. Thank you, Michigan, for delivering Michigan. But more importantly, I think as a university, uh, we need to convey back to uh, 
you know, to the global community that, that you know, we, we are, the, the university is still open for business. It's still a great environment. It's still a great research uh, uh, location, whether it's Wayne State or some other university, but it's one of the best university environments in the world. There, there isn't anything equivalent. And I think conveying that is just something as simple as conveying that is is important otherwise you know i people have mis uh, misunderstandings uh of the, given all the press people have misunderstandings they think they they're absolutely not welcome and you know it's just it's just kind of amazing that this could happen in 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 4 years so i think to john it's it's really important that we should have an outreach uh to the broader community, international community, uh, inviting or, or uh, whatever, making it attractive as, as, you know, business as usual. You know, to- yeah, um, Rob, do you have Nancy. some comments? Nancy, yeah, go yeah. ahead, Rob. Um, I was just gonna say that to Sandeep's point, um, you know, I, I teach a graduate class in uh, industrial systems engineering um, every fall that traditionally, and I've been teaching this class for about, I don't know, six or seven years, and traditionally, it ranges from 50 to 75 percent international students. Um, this year, we have zero international students. They've been gradually um, less and less and less. And it's interesting, this program that we're doing with Hart um, University in Germany, out of their entire group of 40 students, they have one German. The rest of their students are international students that in conversation with many of those students, they would have liked to have come to the US, but to Sandeep's point, did not feel welcome here, did not feel that this was going to be a good environment for, their, to, for them to study. So I think we have a lot of rebuilding um, to do. Um, and I know Ahmad and Farshad, that's top uh, priority on, on your list to do, but um, it has um, had significant consequences, I think, to U.S. universities. Yeah, absolutely. Dean, uh, I had a suggestion. Uh, can we uh, can, can we do recruiting Zoom calls with you know take uh, the I don't know twenty universities that we know historically which universities we have gotten students from take the top 10 and just organize a Zoom call where you do nothing but tell them a little bit about the university to introduce them to five faculty members uh, and just something as small as that could could make a difference uh, and tell them we've had so many students from X, Y, and Z before, so you're welcome and you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I think something as trivial as that could make a huge difference. Sorry, Anurag, you were going to say something. No, no, it's, uh, I, it's, I, uh, no, I to totally share the feeling. Uh, you know, in US, the higher education, the international students are a big driver for the growth of higher education, for research, and a lot of them, including myself and Sandeep, go on to do a few other things in life, which creates even more jobs in, in the country. And it actually adds to the intellectual capital. and. And the fact that we have we are trying to block that that path that bridge is 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 causing a big harm to the nation. And I hope the new administration uh, and we should actually thank the Detroit area to actually deliver the results. Maybe not all of Michigan, uh, but Wayne County and Detroit. Uh, I know there was, there was a big drama last night. Uh, so anyway, the, the point is we need to not only do the outreach, but we need to hopefully change the system and the laws, which allows the students to come. I mean, we can recruit, but if they're blocked at the borders, if they're not allowed to come in, uh, I think it's going to be not a good uh, situation to be in. So we need to work with the new administration and open up the, open up the immigration system, at least the student thing. One of the primary assumptions people make, and they made in the old administration, hopefully it is old, is that when people come here, they actually want to stay here and they steal jobs. And based on my experience, as the other parts of the world grow economically and education-wise, that's actually not true. I, based on my own experience in Mexico, uh, people would love to come and get higher education, but most of them actually want to go back and make a difference in their own culture and society. So that assumption that as soon as we admit someone from abroad, they're going to come and stay and steal jobs 
we need to get beyond that. That is not happening. A lot of Chinese students go back. A lot of Indian students are going back. Uh, and that helps ex changing information, the knowledge. Uh, and we need to just stop this assumption that this is a one-way ticket. This is actually not a one-way ticket. We learn, we go back, or some of we stay and we make a difference in the society. So we need to somehow work in the new, hopefully in the new administration to change that. And while that is going on, I think we should at least spend a little bit more time on Canada and Mexico, because for them, things haven't quite changed. Uh, we have a new UCMCA. So there is no blockage of students and people across between these three countries. So while we figure out how to deal with other international uh, students in other countries, perhaps there's an opportunity to focus a little bit more on the neighbors we have. Uh, you know, one of the things we discussed was to perhaps treat students in Mexico like in-state students, perhaps give them an opportunity and perhaps we can start attracting them and grow our pool of international students in Wayne State. And of course in Canada, which is next door, I remember we used to go to Canada for lunch. I had an office downtown Detroit. So that was a, because they had the best Indian restaurant at that time. So it still gives me kicks that you could actually go for lunch in a new country, a different country and come back. And we should leverage that, that proximity, that alignment. So we, we state one of the things we have been discussing is we need to start rethinking how we operate going forward. Uh, the damage which was done in the last four years I don't know how long it might take to get it undone. Some of the laws are laws now, and they may not be, uh, we may not be able to roll back. So we also have to start thinking a little different uh, in this new environment and, you know, look for opportunities uh, where they exist. I, I totally agree with everything that's been said. Uh, it's, it's, it's been interesting. And actually, in, in addition to, to the, the resources that the international, international students when they come here, they don't take away jobs, but actually, like we have two examples here, they create jobs uh, in, 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 in the country. Um, and uh, we have, uh, Sandeep, I, I, you're, you're, you're right on. We have been doing those types of things of, of outreach. Actually, the pandemic has helped us because now everybody's at home over even in, in other countries. So we're, we've been able to reach them. And we've been doing a lot of webinars and town halls with prospective students. And, and we've reached actually every student who were supposed to come, uh, all the students who were supposed to come in January, but they couldn't because of the pandemic this time. Um, and we're hoping, we were hoping that some of them will be able to come in January, but now with all the, this new lockdowns, we're, we're still unsure, but we're, yeah, we're, we're doubling and tripling our efforts in that, in that regard. Um, and it's, I mean, ultimately, I think it's, as you indicated, is, is really, it's a, it's, it's a war, talent, a war for talent. Um, and I mean, that's what we're competing with against other countries. You know, you have countries like Canada, I don't know if any of you heard a couple of weeks ago, their, one of uh, their, their prime minister uh, launched, announced a new initiative to attract 1.3 million uh, degree basically immigration for 1.3 million people with degrees. They want those people to come to Canada and work in Canada and start businesses in Canada. And I think that's what we're up against uh, when it comes to, uh, to, to this war on talent and for talent. So, but we'll, 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 keep, we'll keep moving, uh, we'll keep trying and with the, all of your efforts uh, and support, I think we can, uh, we're not gonna give up. I don't know how we're doing on time, Farshad and team. <laughs> I think we're going till 11, is that correct? Or I think we're on time. <laughs> we actually had it scheduled till 10.30. Oh, wow. Oh, there is some, somewhere in the world it's not 10.30 yet. <laughs> I bet where uh, Oliver is, it's not 10.30, is it? Sa Sandeep Oliver? is in California, three hours away. Oh, Sandeep <laughs> too, so there it is. No, I, I definitely want to hear uh, if you have, if you're interested to share with us, what are your thoughts? How can alumni like you and friends like you who are on the call, call uh, can help us uh, to broadening this opportunity for our students, especially engineering students. Again, yeah. when you look at an engineering product set out in the market, it is not done singly, solely in one location on the planet 
it is scattered all over the globe in terms of the design, prototyping, and building, manufacturing, and so on. So we need to make sure that our engineers can do that type of work and being able to support them. Again, uh, Anna Rock suggested uh, doing an uh, internship abroad, and we offered some of that to our students last summer and this past one. And uh, Nancy is working through the center to help with this cultural intelligence. We send a student coming back. Sandeep is bringing uh, some centers of excellence around testing, software testing for our students. And that is important because not only we train our students to learn a new technology or product in this case, but also being able to provide internship opportunities for our international students who cannot do internship uh, outside of the campus, especially in recent years, uh, that they can do internship on campus so we don't have to be worried about those type of things. So uh, if you have any thoughts, you can share it with us through email. We have our contact information listed here, or uh, also uh, this is being recorded. We can share with you later on. And uh, if you don't have any other questions right now or comments, um, I would like to thank you again. Any, anybody else? Do I see anybody else commenting? OK, no. So I want to thank everybody for attending uh, today's event. Uh, and I wanted to invite you to attend our next Coffee with the Dean event, which is scheduled for January 15th. And again, the topics that we picked uh, for the new year is be more around the sustainable development goal established by United Nations. So there are 17 sustainable development goals uh, that was laid out by the United Nations. And so the next one would be focusing around water and sanitation. And again, we will have some of our colleagues from the college who will be sharing with us some of the work that they are doing around the Great Lakes and in terms of sanitation and, and quality of the water, especially one of the leading faculty who work with the Flint water crisis is going to be part of the conversation. And in February, I believe February 11, uh, our next topic would be health and wellness. And again, we're inviting faculty from across the college, biomedical engineering and others to uh, share with us some of the work that they're doing in tissue engineering and cancer research, uh, as well as the biomedical, uh, as well as traumatic brain injury studies and so on. So I look forward to those and I invite you to attend it. With that, I wish all of you happy and safe Thanksgiving and thanks again for attending. And I want to thank Nancy, Sandeep, and Anurag and Ahmad for joining us today in Coffee with the Dean. Cheers. And everyone have a great day. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, everyone.